I want to welcome you this morning to our worship service and trust that you'll be encouraged in your relationship with the Lord. Now, today's message is another sermon in Philippians by Pastor Sandy Wilson. I'll join you at the conclusion of the service for a few wrap-up items. This is Grace Alive from Grace Presbyterian Church in Peoria, Illinois. Please join with us as we worship God and study His Word together. Good morning, church. Let's stand as we begin worship this morning and hear the call to worship from Hebrews 1. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making puri purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. We look to Jesus this morning, who is the radiance of the glory of God, and give him praise. Let us sing together. that has breath praise the Lord for Christ has accomplished salvation for us fully 
He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. It is done. And this is why Paul explains, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. We worship by the Spirit and not through white-knuckled moralism. And yet we can fail to remember this. So let us pray for the Lord's help. Loving Heavenly Father, you have created us to worship you alone. Yet, Lord, we are great sinners who wander and run from you often. You regularly exchange your truth for lies. Many times each day we turn from you toward the idols that enchant us, bowing before them and hoping that they will make peace for us. Father, forgive us. Thank you, Jesus, who paid the price for all our sin and worship you alone. Holy Spirit, show us our idolatry. Make Christ more beautiful to us than all other things. In his mighty name we pray. Amen.
Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Church, let us be assured of God's grace and love for us as we sing this next song. How it is holy and divine and it's strange to us that our righteousness does not come from us, yet through Christ, through me. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is
foundation. We trust in you. We offer you all of our greatness and all of our weakness, recognizing that we find our home and perfection and joy in you alone. We thank you for your mercy, and we ask that you would truly help us to believe. We pray all these things in your precious and holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, good, good morning. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace. I have a couple of announcements for us this morning. The first thing I'd like to say is thank you for joining us this morning, coming to worship our God, the only one who is worthy of praise. Whether you're here in person or joining us on live stream, we're so glad to have you. And if you wouldn't mind letting us know that you're here, you can pull out your bulletin, and in there is the connection card. It's got a perforated edge. You can let us know that you're here, as well as this is a wonderful way to be able to carry one another's burdens with one another, because you can share prayer requests on there. If this is one of your first times worshiping with us, or you've just been checking us out for a little while, we'd love to have you stop by the Welcome Center just there in the atrium. We have a little gift for you, or even at the end of the service, many of us pastors come up to the front. We'd love to meet you uh, and get to know your name. The next announcement I have for us is that Easter is less than a month away, which is a very exciting thing as we come together to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. At the Welcome Center this morning, there is invitations out there for you to be able to pass out to friends and family. This is, has invitation and information for both Good Friday and Easter, so feel free to pick up a stack of those and begin to invite people to come with you to celebrate or even to just explore what the Christian faith is about. The next announcement I have for you guys is resources for parents. I made this announcement actually last month as well. I've been here at Grace for just over a year now, and recently I've learned about some rooms that I didn't know about here at Grace. Uh, and so for especially resources, those of you who have little ones with you that might get a little bit wiggly during the service, I just wanted to highlight these couple for you. Uh, in the children's ministry, just outside these doors, in the purple room, the first door on the right, there is a nursing mother's room where you still get to see both, you still get to hear the service as well as get to see it live streamed there uh, if your little one needs some time, as well as in these back left doors of the sanctuary, there you can find a cry room if you need it, or even over on this side of the building, there's the chapel where there's both audio and visual for the sermon as well, or for the whole service. And the last, uh, uh, the last announcement I have for you is that there is a video we're going to watch from the short-term missions team that just returned from Guadalajara. So if you would, turn your attention up to the screens. Buenos dias! My name is Karen Cordes, and last month we had the privilege of going on a missions trip to Mexico to help with the ministry of our missionaries Tomas and Melody Vidal. They direct, live, and teach at the Matthew Training Center, a Bible school near Guadalajara. We loved the opportunity to see firsthand how Tomas and Melody are serving the Lord, and we also really enjoyed getting to know the 12 students that are currently enrolled in the six-month course that is offered twice a year. The current students, between 18 and 25 years old, are obviously hungry to learn more of God's Word so that they can then go out to see where the Lord leads them. Greg Sanderson led our team with confidence and patience. We appreciated his fluency in Spanish and his enthusiasm for mingling with people wherever he was, like playing soccer, running to the local store, evangelizing on the streets, giving his testimony to the students, and generally helping out wherever he was needed. Randy and Marilyn Cock blessed everyone immensely with their work in the kitchen. They made and served some foreign dishes from places like India, China, and the Mediterranean, but also some very typical Western dishes like shepherd's pie and hamburger soup and spaghetti. We all enjoyed all of it. Marilyn loved hearing the students sing worship songs while they hand wash dishes after every meal. She couldn't understand the words, but she could tell that those gospel songs were being sung with deep devotion and incredible joy. Eli Sanderson, who is Greg's teenage son, really enjoyed getting to know the students. And he was a great sport about whitewashing a long cement brick wall, as well as joining his dad's enthusiasm in handing out sandwiches on the street and being a great help anywhere and everywhere. Lisa Velpel, who had never left the United States before, handled the different cultural issues and different foods like a pro. She was thrilled to be able to bless the people with her love of sewing, 
by mending about nine different garments for the students and staff, and they were so grateful. I thoroughly enjoyed getting to know the students and staff too, and I tried to jump in to help wherever needed, mostly in the kitchen, and I savored every typical Mexican food I put in my mouth. I was most encouraged by Luna, an 18-year-old student who shared how the Lord is prodding her towards missions work in a different country, a lot like how the Lord prodded me when I was her age. I was also so thrilled that the students go every Tuesday to help out at a children's home, which happens to be the same children's home where we have led missions teams from Grace previously. We would love to tell you more about this incredible trip, so please come to the missions kiosk after the service. The whole team will be there to share our stories, and all six of us would like to thank you for sending us and giving us this opportunity to represent all of you on this great mission trip. Well, what a wonderful thing, yeah. What a wonderful thing to uh, be able to put the, the, the faces of the team, getting to see them in action. That missions kiosk is loaded just out these doors back here to the right towards the, the street side of the building if you want to visit with them after. And what a wonderful thing. We'll actually get a chance later in our service to even pray for the missionaries they went and partnered with. But right now, speaking of prayer, I'd like to invite Brad and Joy and Everett up for prayer this morning. Both Brad and Joy um, are members here at Grace Presbyterian Church. They've been married for a little over two years. And this past August, they got to welcome the birth of their first here, who is Everett, who is a very cheerful little baby. I've actually gotten to know him quite well. Um, Everett, while he's new to many of you, uh, you've probably seen him around, but he has frequently attended volleyball with the young adult ministry here. Um, he hasn't played yet, but I don't think he, I think he's only missed one or two times since he's been born. And so we've had just the great privilege as a community getting to see both Brad and Joy become parents and even getting to know Everett and seeing him grow. Uh, Brad and Joy, is, it, it, while it has been a privilege getting to see you guys become parents, there is a task that is still before you as parents. As we read in the Psalms that children are a heritage or a blessing from the Lord, or in Proverbs 22, 6, we read that we're to train up a child in the way that he should go, so that even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And while it's difficult right now to imagine little Everett as old, there's many things he needs to learn. There's many things he needs to be trained up in. He needs to learn how to walk and to talk, how to feed himself, all of these different things. But he also needs to know the Lord who knit him together in his mother's womb. And this morning you've requested prayer and you're expressing your needs for the Lord's help in raising Everett. So church, if you would join me in prayer, not only for the Zares, but also for our missionary partners and as well as for our offering and our worship service together this morning. Our Father, great are you. You are a father to the fatherless. You care and rejoice over your people. You discipline us because you love us. Father, I pray that you would bless Brad and Joy as they parent Everett together. Lord, that they, that they would teach him to diligently store up your truth, that they would talk of your grace when they sit in their home or when they walk by the way, that their home would be a place in which your blessings are praised and your fatherly discipline welcome. For Brad, I pray that he would not provoke Everett to anger, but bring him up in the discipline and instruction of your son, Jesus. For joy, I pray that she would teach what is good and that she would see peace in Everett's life. For Everett, I pray that he would obey his parents, honoring them and so honoring you, his maker and master, that by the means of your divine appointment, you would give him the gift of faith and all of the benefits of Christ, the only Savior. Lord, bless their home in the joyful and mundane days. Help them to see that their many labors to care for this little one are not lost but in their love and service, they are tending to a tender heart in need of the grace of the Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the mission trips that has returned safely, for the impact and even the, the fellowship that they were able to have there. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless and encourage the missionaries there that they partnered with as they were even able to meet with John and Cassie Mahan, Tumas and Melody Vidal, and Lord, that as they even stay behind and are some missionaries that we partner with in your work, I pray that they would be encouraged for the work that you've prepared for them, that you would provide for them their daily bread, and that you would bring in a harvest of faith. 
Bless their families and their homes with peace and patience as they labor. Lord, prepare our hearts this morning for the hearing and preaching of your word. Let your word be sweeter to us than honey. And as we come now to the offering, I pray that you would create in us joyful hearts, a faithful stewardship of the resources you have blessed us with, that these gifts would be used to honor the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus is my life. Someone may say, is that all you've got? I mean, you've got no money in the bank. You don't have an advanced degree. You don't have a great job. You don't have a boyfriend. Well, are you happy? We're going to find out from our text today. Would you please be seated? It is so good to see you today. 
especially on, this is, a, this is a red letter day. I think it ought to go in the church liturgical calendar. It's clock change day. And everyone who comes gets a little extra credit. You say, I wasn't getting credit in the first place. You're right, I know. I was just out of the top of my head. But it's so good to see you, especially on a foggy, misty day. I woke up this morning and I said, this is just a beautiful Peoria day. <laughs> beautiful Peoria day. So I'm glad to be with you on this beautiful Peoria day. And then to have Everett prayed for this morning. I think of all the little kids here, some of whom you can hear and some you can't hear, but they're all here. And uh, how wonderful to see the next generation being reared up right in front of us. It's just terrific. Well, we've been studying the book of Philippians. And remember the context. Paul is in prison. You know, they say that Christians are like tea bags. We only do our best work in hot water. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is doing. He is in hot water. This guy is under house arrest, which means he's chained hand and foot on four-hour shifts with guards in the imperial or praetorian guard. Not what you'd call a comfortable life. But in the midst of this great trial, we learn what Christianity is all about. This tea bag, the Apostle Paul, is in some hot water, and you're getting tea. It's wonderful. We're getting the Christian life displayed for us. We've seen how he starts off by just thanking the, God, the Lord and God of all creation for them, and for their partnership in the gospel. We saw in chapter 1, he says, look, would you all rejoice with me? I'm actually happy, and the reason is my sermons are four hours long because they're chained to me for four hours and can't get away. And nobody tells me my sermon is too long because they're chained to me. He's got a captive audience. And he said, I'm leading people to Christ. And the, the word is known out there everywhere. So rejoice with me. And then he says to them, you can make my joy complete if you all will stand together in a unified way as one body, contending for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only way you can do that that we saw in chapter 2 is through one of our core values at Grace Presbyterian, gospel humility. You ain't going to get there without gospel humility. It takes tremendous humility to build a united body of Christ. We saw in chapter 2 that we not only have the model of Jesus Christ, but we are in Christ. So organically, we have Christ. He's all I have. He's all I need. And Christ is working through me to give me something of his humility to build the unity, to be a contributor to the unity of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we didn't read the end of chapter 2 where Paul commends Timothy and Epaphroditus. Great lessons on leadership there. You might go home and study the latter half, half of chapter 2. But we're racing through Philippians because we only go through the end of March and then you pick up with this young guy called Zach. Um, so I don't have an office anymore. The other day, first day of uh, the week this week, I went to my office, and there's a big sign that says, Welcome, Zach. <laughs> that's, no, that's when you know your time is up. <laughs> so we'll continue to study Philippians through March, and you know how excited I am about Zach. We've been spending the week together, and you just have a godly, young, eager, smart, uh, talented uh, pastor on the way, uh, and I'm so excited for you. We're going to pick up with chapter 3. Now, in chapter 3 of Philippians, what we get is a display of the heart of the uniqueness of evangelical Christianity. So if you're here and you don't know what evangelical Christianity is, you're going to find out today. You're going to know why it's unique. You're going to know why we treasure it so much, why it's so important, and why you can't live really, you can't live eternally without it. So the message is absolutely crucial. This first part of chapter 3 is at the very fulcrum point of the evangelical Christian faith. So would you please stand with me? We're going to pray, and then we're going to read 11 verses. And once again, we won't take the second half of chapter 3 today either, E even though I'll be making some references to it. Let's pray together. Father, your kindness to us is overwhelming. When we gather in this room to worship you and to hear you speak your word to us, we're reminded of the benefits that we've received that we can't even describe them. 
we do our best and we'll do it this morning to study what you've done for us and to study what it means for us. Please help us. With all of our limitations, with all of our sins and failures, please help us to believe, to understand, to receive, and to obey. Speak, O Lord, for your servants listen through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Philippians 3, verse 1, hear the word of God. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. All flesh is like grass and all its glory is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Please be seated. After I graduated from the University of Virginia in 1973, uh, the first job I took and the only secular job I really had after college was with the Bethlehem Steel Corporation, at that time the second largest steel corporation in the country. And it was based in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, so I moved to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And I had an electrical engineering degree, but I didn't know much about metallurgy, which was the business I was getting ready to go into. So I took some extra courses at Penn State on metallurgy. I wanted to know about the, what they call the making and shaping of steel including how you heat treat steel and how it all works. And I even joined a metallurgical society. Boy, that's an exciting group, I want you to know. <laughs> yeah, somebody belong, belongs to it. So this is 48 years ago. I go to my first meeting. It's a little dinner with a speaker at the American Society for Metals. So I sit down with my little table it was a rectangular table. And after the initial pleasantries, there was a guy sitting right across from me. He was a metallurgist. He was old. And uh, he, I knew I wasn't going to like him from the very beginning because I wasn't a Christian at the time, and I could tell there was something nice about him, and it bugged me. And right off the bat, he said to me, right across the table, first question, he says, what do you think is the most important thing in life? Now, I knew I didn't like him. <laughs> I gave him an Aristotelian answer. I didn't know at the time it was Aristotelian. I found that out later. But I said to him, well, I suppose uh, to be happy. And uh, then he asked me a second question. He said, and how do you think a human being becomes happy? 
I didn't have an answer. But I got one now. And my answer actually is the Apostle Paul's answer. And that's what I want us to look at. How does one really receive true joy? How do you become the human being God created you to be after the fall of humanity? In all of your sin and failure, all your disappointments, the fact that you're going to die soon. I don't know if you hadn't thought about that lately. The preacher's here to remind you. It's a pretty depressing thing. When you look at the sorrows of human life, I've been depressed this week. I've been in tears this week over the illness of dear friends and their children. How do we get through? How do we have joy in this life? Paul tells us. Now, I want you to look at verse 1 and you get the first principle. That the joy of the Lord is, our joy in life is only in the Lord. We are to rejoice in the Lord. Now, you've heard that so much, those of you who have been in Christians for a while, you've heard it so much, you've forgotten how unique this is, how particular it is, how specific, how unusual. Paul has shown us in chapter 1 and chapter 2 where he gets his joy. In chapter 3, he's turning the tables and he's saying, I've told you about my joy, now let's talk about your joy. And he says to them a command, not only do I rejoice, which I've repeated several times to you already in this letter, I rejoice in the Lord, I'll say it again, he says, I rejoice. But now he says, I want you to rejoice, and here's how you're to do it in the Lord. There was a very famous philosopher who is contemporary with the Apostle Paul. They were probably born around the same time. It ends up, they they died, I think, probably in the same year or within a year of each other. His name was Seneca. Seneca was a highly educated, very intelligent man. He's published, his, his works are well known in philosophical circles. He was a Stoic. If you know something about Christian ethics, you know that the Apostle Paul actually borrowed a lot of things from the Stoics. We don't agree ultimately with the worldview of the Stoics, but our ethics overlap with the Stoics in many ways. In fact, it's kind of interesting. You may know that the great John Calvin, maybe one of the greatest theologians who ever lived, and I always recommend the Institutes of the Christian Religion for anyone who's willing to journey their way through it, Calvin's dad wanted him to become a lawyer and make some money. So out of obedience to his father, he went to law school. While he was in law school, his first book that he ever published was a commentary on the sayings of Seneca. In fact, Christians for centuries had called this stoic pagan philosopher our Seneca because what he believed and taught was so close to what we thought. He was an upstanding right and wrong, good and evil sort of person. And the Christians thought well of Seneca, but he was a pagan. Seneca taught, like Aristotle, that the chief end of man is his happiness. So that was Seneca's core idea. But here's what Seneca said. This is, and Paul was very familiar with this. You can read Seneca in some ways in Paul's letters. He obviously was influenced by the Stoics. Seneca said, here's how you achieve that happiness. Through philosophy, through thinking, through higher thought, which then leads to what the classical philosophers called the good life. And the good life to them, not was like we think today, pleasure and money and travel and all that. The good life was the virtuous life according to the pagan virtues. So a thinking person who's living the virtuous life will be the one that finds happiness. That was Seneca's belief. Paul contradicts it. Paul says, no. Joy is found only in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you've got to realize if there was a public vote, Seneca versus the prisoner Paul, Paul would get crushed. His opinion is is a very small minority opinion. 
And I suspect you sometimes feel that your opinions are real small of minority opinion. That didn't concern Paul. What concerned Paul was to give the truth and of his own experience and his own theological knowledge and of his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he knew we must learn to rejoice in the Lord. Now, Paul's going to show us what that means. But we don't just find joy from family, as fun as that is, or success in your business, or your intellectual capacity, or even living the ethical life and have everybody respect you. It's not a matter of honor. No, it's a matter of being in the Lord and delighting in Him, and we'll see how that works. Now, the second thing you have to notice in this text is not only the commandment, rejoice in the Lord, but you get a warning. And that's the second thing we want to notice with verses 2 and 3. You've got to look out for the joy thieves. Look out for the joy thieves. Well, you notice he says three times, look out. And he, first of all, he says, look out for the dogs. That was going to be the title of my sermon today, and I thought, that's a little abrupt, so I changed it. But <laughs> look out for them dogs. And then he says, look out again, same word, for the evildoers. He calls them evildoers. And then he says again, look out. Look out for what? The mutilators of the flesh. What's he talking about? Here's what he's talking about. First of all, when we say dog, I think of my little golden doodle, how cute he is, how furry, funny he is. I love dogs. That's not what Paul's talking about. These are wild dogs, kind of like wolves. They can be ferocious. Uh, they're not household animals. They're wild animals. And that's the reason that Jews call the Gentiles dogs. Now, here's the interesting irony. Paul is reversing the usage of the word and saying it's not the Gentiles. The ones I'm calling dogs are the Judaizers. Here's who a Judaizer is. A Judaizer is a person who had been introduced to Christ, who is part of the church, who professed faith in Christ, but they also said you can't really be a Christian with eternal life unless you also become Jewish and take on the traditions. So you, have, you men have to be circumcised. Now that would thin out the church population right there. But he was saying, all of you men and women, you better follow, and by the way, if you don't know what circumcision is, ask your daddy when you get home. Uh, and you men and women, you have to follow the dietary laws. And you all have to know the, the teachings of the rabbis. In other words, you have to take the markers that marked out a Jewish believer in the first century AD, and all of you have to do that, or you're not really a believer. That's what they were teaching. And these were heretics, and they were leading Christians astray who thought, well, I guess I better get on with it. And it's not just a matter of receiving Jesus Christ alone as my Savior. I'm supposed to identify with these people by doing certain things. There are certain markers. Now look how Paul responds to this in uh, verse 3. He says, look out for them. I'm warning you. You've got heresy in your midst. And I'm going to talk about some of the heresies in our midst, in our own culture. But he says, look out for them, and here's why. And he gives four hallmarks of real Christians. Now let's look at them in verses three and four. We are the circumcision. Hang on just a minute. Circumcision meant to be a Jewish person. That's what they did. They were the circumcised. Paul is now making a remarkable statement to Gentiles. I mean, hang on just a second. Do you think the Philippian jailer was a Jew? Certainly not. He was very Gentile. And Paul says, you're the Jew. We are the circumcised. Paul was Jewish. He was circumcised. But he's talking to the Philippians. He's saying, all of us who are Christians are the circumcised. You say, 
How can he really mean that? Well, turn back a little bit in your Bible to Galatians chapter 3. Two, two letters before Philippians. And look at verse 27. He says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So now here's a, an implication of that. Verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. So that distinction is abolished. It's gone. Now, those of you trained in a dispensational background, please especially look at this. Really, this is, this is a serious contradiction to historic dispensationalism. We don't have two different plans for Jew and Gentile. Paul says that distinction is abolished. He says, neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, that's abolished. There's no male or female, that is abolished in terms of male being considered more important or more valuable than females, that's gone. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now look at 29, this is the key verse. And if you are Christ's, okay, Jew or Gentile, you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are Abraham's offspring. Now just sit with that for a moment. This is what undermines both Judaizing in the first century and undermines dispensationalism in the 20th and 21st century. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring. Look at this, heirs according to the promise. What promise? The promise to Abraham. What promise? A great people, a land, descendants as numerous as the stars in heaven. That is the promise. And ultimately the promise, as you see in Galatians, is the gift of the Spirit. And Paul says that's, that belongs to anyone in Christ. So the Old Testament promises, that would be the promises to Abraham, he's an Old Testament figure, the father of, of our faith. All of those benefits, all of those promises devolve upon us. You say, when's that gonna happen? You happen to have studied it last year for the whole year in the book of Revelation. It's the new heaven and the new earth. That's the dispensation. It's the eternal dispensation when all the promises to Abraham are fulfilled to God's people. Look at another example. Turn back another uh, few books into Romans. And Paul addresses this again. He says at the end of chapter 2, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. Okay, he says there is a physical circumcision just like there's a physical baptism. And baptism fulfills circumcision in its intent in the Old Testament. So you circumcise your male child at eight days of age. Now we baptize our children uh, when they're young because they get the marker of the covenant. But Paul says, look, that happens and the church has its ceremonies and the church has its sacraments. But the real circumcision and the real baptism is a matter of the heart. So as the prophet said in the Old Testament, circumcise your hearts. And now we say, baptize your hearts. That's what's to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. So water baptism is wonderful. It's a sacrament of the church. But the real important baptism that's eternal and that marks you out is a spiritual one. He says, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not the letter. His praise is not from men, but from God. So you can see here what Paul is saying. Here's your answer to the Judaizers. They're now defunct. The temple uh, will be destroyed in another 10 years after this letter. And God's judgment comes upon the old order. It's abolished. And now Jew and Gentile are the Israel of God in one people. So Paul says, don't let the Judaizers throw you off. You are the people of God. You always were. You're the elect of God from all eternity and certainly from the Old Testament. But then keep reading. We are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So he gives four hallmarks of real Christians. 
And he says, don't let the legalists who want to tell you it's Christ plus something that you do or something that you wear. No, it's Christ plus nothing. And Paul makes that absolutely clear. This is important, ladies and gentlemen, because you'll never have the joy of the Lord if you don't understand this. You have been on God's mind for all eternity. And everything that has happened since he said, said let there be light, has been to bring you to the point of being his people. And nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are the circumcision. You are the people of God. You're the ones that he has longed for from all eternity. So Paul says, watch out for them dogs. Those who mutilate the flesh. They're not circumcisers, they're mutilators. That's what he says. And look, he says they're evildoers. So when you're looking at a heresy that strikes at the core, not the mistakes that we make, I mean, the Baptists and the Presbyterians can't both be right. We know this, but it's not a difference that threatens the core of the gospel. So we don't call it heresy. We call it a disagreement on secondary doctrines. So we're not talking about secondary doctrines that divide evangelicals into denominations. We're talking about something that threatens your joy in the gospel, in Christ. And he says, watch out. So yes, we receive the love of God, but you have to guard it. And then you have to implement it in your life. So it is a gift. And as we sang earlier, not yet not I, but through Christ in me. So we even live the Christian life by his power, but we do live it intentionally with him, partnering with the spirit and living the life. But now he's talking about primarily the gift that you've received. So now look, when we begin with verses four through 11, we come to the third major point, And that is, okay, you watch out, you look out for your joy thieves, but positively you glory in Jesus Christ. We must imitate the apostle. So Paul says, do not imitate the false teachers. Imitate me. And any discipleship leader, any small group leader, any parent, anybody who's leading a discipleship group in the Christian faith, when you teach, you say, why don't you imitate me? I know that's scary to the teacher and the leader, but that Paul shows us the example. He's not perfect and he knows it. But he says, imitate me. Here's how you imitate him, four ways. Number one, you put no confidence in the flesh. So if you'll notice, Paul will take what he just said about you in verses two and three, and in reverse order, he's gonna begin to show you how it works out in his own life. Do you notice that? Look at two and three, the four hallmarks, the last one being putting no confidence in the flesh. Now Paul is saying, now I wanna tell you about myself. And here we're gonna get the personal testimony of the greatest Christian who ever lived. Wow, I'm so thankful for verses four through 11. Once, there are several places where this happens with the apostle. This is a very notable instance of it where his heart is flayed open and we get to see. And he says, okay, I'm gonna tell you. First of all, I put no confidence in the flesh. Don't you put any confidence in the flesh. That's the first point he makes uh, in verses four through uh, seven, if I have that right, four through six. Now look how he says it. He says uh, in, in verse four, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I have more. <laughs> so he says, <clears throat> let me tell you what these Judaizers are telling you. I've got more of their stuff than they have but I wanna show you, I put no confidence in it. And Paul goes through seven aspects of his life. You'll notice the first four have to do with his legacy. You know, look at these first four statements he makes. He, he says, Here, here's who I am. Uh, I was circumcised on the eighth day. You wanna know about circumcision? I'm circumcised, I know all about it. And I did on the eighth day according to the Old Testament. So I have a legacy, a Jewish legacy. And then he says, I'm of the people of Israel. I belong 
to the people of Israel. So I know what I'm talking about. I've got all those credentials they've been telling you you're supposed to have. And then he says, of the tribe of Benjamin. That is, I wasn't a proselyte. I'm natural born. And furthermore, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. Do you folks know who Benjamin is? He was, his tribe was one of the two that supported King David. You had the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. Everybody else separated off. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And then he says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I have a long legacy of Hebrews. I'm one of them. I'm Jewish ethnically, not just by religious background. And then look, now he gives us three aspects of his great performance. So he goes from his legacy to his performance. What does he say? He says, as to the law of Pharisees. So he says, I've got theological credentials. I was trained for years at the feet of Gamaliel, the great Pharisee. I am a Pharisee by training. As to zeal, let me tell you how zealous I was for my Jewish faith. I used to put people in prison and even have them murdered because they were Christians. I was a, I was a religious terrorist. That's how zealous I was. So don't tell me somebody else has got more zeal than I do. And then he says, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Now look, Paul doesn't think for a minute that he's perfect. What he means is, the way the Pharisees measure things, which is only outward conformity to the outward demands of the law. There's nothing on my record. But of course, Paul teaches, just as Jesus did, that the law applies not just to your outer conduct, it applies to your heart, your motivations, your intentions, your attitude. Paul knows he's far from perfect, far from blameless. But in the view of the Pharisees, he's blameless. I've got more credentials than they have. But now look what he says about all this in verses 7 through 11. This is where he teaches us that we not only put no confidence in the flesh, we glory in Christ Jesus. Why do I say that? Well, look what Paul is saying. He's saying, I've got all of these credentials. Let me tell you what I think they're worth. Nothing. They are of absolutely no value to me. They get me nowhere in terms of my standing with God. And he says, they're actually worse than nothing. He says, they're refuse, or you could say garbage, or literally, Paul uses kids a bad word here. He says, dumb. It's total dumb. It's an obstruction. It's a detraction. It's a liability. It's an impediment. It's in my way. I had to get rid of it as any claim on my religious life and my standing before God. And the reason he says that, you see it in the verses, so that I may have him. If you're claiming your legacy and your performance, you have less of him. To the degree that you claim your legacy and your performance as who you are as a believer, you have less of Christ. And that's the reason that Kevin and Sean and this music group, every Sunday, I don't think we miss a Sunday when we don't sing to the Lord how desperately we need him because we have nothing without him. And that's exactly what the Christian view is. We treasure the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou, O Christ, says Charles Wesley, thou, O Christ, art all I want. More than all in thee I find. Raise the fallen. Cheer the faint. Heal the sick. Lead the blind. What a great Savior. And we treasure him. And these performance orientations, these Judaizing and moralistic and legalistic ways of being a religious person absolutely get in our way when we think about our standing before God. Now, thirdly, and this is getting to the core of it, when you get to, to verses uh, 7 through 9a, I think it is, yes, we, we see that we treasure him. But when you get to 9b, we must receive 
his righteousness by faith. This is what Paul says in 9b. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. So my righteousness, which is my justification, so I'm justified before God or considered righteous by him, not by my performance. Now, my performance is important. We've been reading about our performance for years together. The Bible's injunctions upon our ethical life, there are many, many, many injunctions and commandments, and we want to keep them. But my keeping those commandments to whatever degree I'm able to keep them is not the ground of my standing before Christ or before God. Because when I'm at my best, Paul says, if you compare what, I, what God demands before his perfect throne of justice to what I do and what I am at my best, it's dumb. Or as Isaiah said, once again, a pretty crude way of saying it, I guess we would say, but it's filthy rags. That's what you are at your best. Why? Because God is holy. How in the world then can I have the joy of knowing that God receives me, loves me, and accepts me in his sight? Paul says, by forsaking all this other stuff by which we identify ourselves. And we identify ourselves in one way, as beggars who have received the gift of perfect righteousness from someone else who accomplished it for us. So when Jesus saves us, look, he does pardon our sins. We sang about that, but here's what we didn't sing about. It's the other half of what he did for us. He does pardon our sins, but he also imputes or reckons or gives to us total, perfect righteousness by which we stand before the Lord. Now, this is a major distinction between Roman Catholicism and evangelical Protestantism. I don't have time this morning to go into the details. But if any of you know the Catholic priest, ask him if I told you the truth today. I mean, they're very clear on this. When Calvin and Luther taught this from the scriptures, Soon after Luther died, there was a council, a major international council of the Roman church called the Council of Trent, and it's called a counter-reformational council, whereby they said anybody who believes they have righteousness through faith alone is damned. That's the reason we can't bridge this gap. They have what they call an infallible decree from Trent that they can't violate. And we've got this that we can't violate. We're stuck. Now, I'm not saying that every Roman Catholic is not saved, but I'm saying they're saved in spite of some very lousy teaching from their church on a core doctrine of how you stand and are accepted before God. And it's only received through faith. Paul says, I want what I can receive through faith, which is a perfect, total, eternal, unchangeable righteousness, which will justify me before God rather than any accolades, and he had a bunch of them. He didn't list them all here by any stretch of the imagination. And he said, I consider that refuse. Give me Jesus and his righteousness. That's the claim of Christian. That's the reason we're so humble or supposed to be. That's the reason, well, let me put it this way, in my own life. This is the reason that pride is so atrocious. What do I have to be proud about? Well, that I'm a beggar that's received help from a sovereign king and give me what is the contrary of what I deserved. Now, go brag about that. That, that is, is the gospel. So pride just doesn't work in the Christian life. It's totally contrary to the core of the gospel. You see it here. Now, thirdly, if you look at verse 10, it's not only our justification, but we share in his sufferings. Now we're getting to the sanctification and the lifestyle. And Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And I want to share in his sufferings. You say, why in the world? I mean, the sufferings of Christ? Christ got whipped, spit on, crown of thorns put down on his head, nailed to a cross, a spear in his side. Who wants that? Paul says, I do. 
because I want to become like him in his death. What was Jesus like in his death? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Those are just two of the seven last words. That's what Jesus was like. And Paul says, I want to be like that. And I know how we get like that. We take the cross and we bear it with joy. Not because we enjoy pain, but because we enjoy intimacy with the one that we treasure above all others. And when you have suffered for the gospel, you have experienced an exquisitely joyful, painful experience. It sounds like a contradiction in terms in a secular age. It's not. A joyful, painful experience. For you have come to know Jesus much better than you ever would have known him. Those of you in spiritual leadership as parents, elders, deacons, Sunday school teachers, small group leaders, evangelists in your school, in your workplace, do you know what I'm talking about? You will suffer the sufferings of Jesus Christ and share with him in his sufferings. And you say, what a privilege. What joy. I'm being made to be like him. Lastly, look at verse 11. And so, somehow, <laughs> it seems like an impossibility that I could ever be justified before God, that I could ever be made to be superior to one of the angels, <laughs> that I could ever actually be one of his sons. <laughs> that just seems totally impossible. So somehow, to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where you're headed. You're headed for glory. You're going to sing hallelujah chorus on key. <laughs> I get to lead the orchestra, by the way. Uh, but you're going to sing on key with joy coming out of your heart. You're going to sit down at the wedding feast of the Lamb and just eat it up and enjoy the affection and the love and the dear people that you've lost through the years and will continue to lose in this life, they'll be there. It's almost too much. Paul says, do you want to know how to have joy? Don't listen to the rubbish that comes from liberal Protestantism, liberal Catholicism, traditional Catholicism, secularism, any of these others that deny our way of being accepted, our only way of being accepted before God. Don't listen to it. Give it no credence whatsoever. Now, follow the apostle. Treasure Christ above all things, not just now, but for your eternity. And receive the justification, the righteousness that he alone can offer that really gets you into his presence for eternity. Share in this life the sufferings because our citizenship is in heaven, says Paul later in this chapter, and we're going to have our bodies gloriously transformed to be like his body. So when you know your past, you know your present intimacy with Christ, and you know your future, this is where joy comes from. And there's no other way to have the joy that God intended for his creatures than this. So sometime soon, I'll be in the new heaven and the new earth, and I'll sit down at the wedding feast of the Lamb. And I kind of hope that sitting across from me is an old metallurgist. <laughs> and he'll know by the way I'm dressed that I figured it out. And he'll say to me, Wilson, I had no idea how great this would be. And after I hug him and kiss him, I suppose I'll say to him, I didn't either. <laughs> Let's pray.
Father, our hearts are bowed with our heads because we are unworthy of such a gospel. Why should we receive this good news when we've lived our lives in such a way that every single one of us deserves bad news? It stuns us. We're slack-jawed again at your love. And our request is you help us to believe it. It's out of this world. Help us to believe it so much that we have a deep, abiding, true joy. The joy of your spirit in our lives. The joy of Christ being in us. And enable us joyfully to share in your sufferings in this life, knowing that this life is very short. We shall soon see you and all of our brothers and sisters. And how God, with deep gratitude in our hearts, we now sing what we believe in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Church, let's stand and respond in worship.
if you've given your whole life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you've done the only reasonable thing a safe person can do. If you haven't, please come talk to one of us. Pastors will be up here up front. We'd love to talk with you about it and encourage you any way we can. This gospel is great. We've been singing about it. It's great for us, and we need to be reminded of it so we can live in the light of it and rejoice in it. We also need to talk to our friends. There's so many people. I sit with them on the airplane every time I've come up here who don't know Christ. They don't know him. I had a man on the plane just recently. He told me he, well, he used to be a Christian and now it doesn't make any more sense to him. And I just told him because I was studying this text. I said, I'm just so sad for you. I said, I derive such joy from knowing Christ and living for him and proclaiming him. I can't imagine abandoning what you've abandoned. And I just prayed for him the rest of the way and gave him my contact information. We're supposed to reach people that they may be the recipients of this great news. You'll see in the atrium, a little card, he has risen. It's about the Easter Sunday service. Great time to invite your friends who need to know Jesus. Some of your family members, and just ask them to come with you. You meet them in the parking lot and you walk with them in here and walk with them out to the parking lot to their car. You can have lunch with them afterwards if you want. But let's reach out to the people around us who don't know what we're talking about this morning. They need to hear and they will hear on Easter Sunday morning. And you can, you can bring them before then if you want to, <laughs> but that's certainly a big day. And now, brothers and sisters, let us go our way with great joy, no matter what your circumstances, because I'll tell you your circumstances, he loves you and has justified you, and you're gonna be in his presence. Those are your circumstances. So let's rejoice, receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. And please submit any prayer requests that you would like me or the pastoral staff to pray for this week. You can write to us at Grace Alive, P.O. Box 9272, Pure Illinois 61612. Or you can email us at gracealive at gracepress.org. Call us during business hours at 309-693-3641. Join me now in prayer. Father, we come to you this very day and perhaps some things that are hard for us to work through, maybe a health, a relationship, or as I recently was with a friend, uh, just uh, the political and moral and spiritual climate in our state and our country, Father, many things can set us back. I pray that we would recognize your purposes for our life, to recognize that Christ came into a Roman world with much oppression, and uh, Lord, that we would turn to Christ and see Christ for the midst of our life and the impact they can have in our state, in our country, around the world. Father, use us as salt and light to a watching world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.